After beating Nocturne without using demons, I wanted to try the opposite, beating Nocturne without the Demifiend. In Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne, Demifiend is your main protagonist, and normally you cannot remove him from your party, unless you use glitches. In the PC version of the HD remaster, it's possible to perform a glitch called the Lunch Break. This glitch allows you to permanently dismiss Demifiend, and surprisingly, the game remains playable. But there are two issues with this. First, to perform the glitch, you need demons, and before you get the chance to recruit demons, you have to survive the tutorial and win the mini boss fight. This means that beating the entire game without the Mithin is impossible. Alright, guys, thank you for watching, and I guess I will see you next. <laughs> okay, so in order to make this work, the run will officially start once I get enough demons to send Demifin to the Shadow Realm. The second issue is that once he is dismissed, he will not be able to earn EXP, and this is pretty bad because Demifin's level matters for recruiting and fusing demons. Thankfully, my good buddy Zephyr came to the rescue. He managed to create a mod that changes the first skill Demifin can learn into Watchful, a skill allowing your unit to earn EXP, even if they aren't in battle. So in today's video, Demifin will try to become the very best like no one ever was, by sitting on the bench while his demons attempt to beat the game on hard mode and obtain the true demon ending. Alright, time to summon my first demon. This is Fuxian from the Lady Clan, and she's also related to today's sponsor, Honkai Star Rail. Honkai Star Rail is the brand new fantasy RPG by Hoyoverse, the creators of Genshin Impact, and it takes place in the final frontier. Space! The free to play smashing hit with 80 million downloads is getting a new version update and also two highly anticipated new characters, Imbibitor Lunae and Fu Xian. Dan Hong was already the highlight of the game for me, and it somehow became even cooler by turning into Imbibitor Lunae. This tall and handsome man is a powerful damage dealer who follows the path of destruction and will annihilate any demon standing in your way. We are also getting Fu Xian, who is a quantum type character of the Path of Preservation. She can protect her allies by reducing the damage they take and by redirecting damage towards her. She's an excellent support character who will make a fine addition to your collection. But that's not all because the new update version 1.3 drops on August 30th and is coming with a lot of brand new content. It will give us more story and lore as well as a new roguelike mode to test our skills. Oh, and here's a little tip for ya. If you log in for 7 days, you can claim 10 Star Rail special passes for free and these can be used to pull for our lovely Lunae and Fu Xian. There is no better time to get into the Star Rail hype train, and you can do so by clicking on the link in the description to download the game. And once you are in, make sure to also use the redemption code below to redeem 50 Stellar Jade. Many thanks to Hoyoverse for sponsoring this video. Before we begin, I have to choose which version of Nocturne I want to play. Pokemon Maniacs or Pokemon Chronicle? Each version comes with its own exclusive demon that you will encounter. I have no idea who this guy is, so I decided to go with Pokemon Maniacs in order to meet El Dante, El Exterminador de Demonios. Nocturne starts the same way it always does. I give myself the most shameless name I could think of, watch the world burn, and after being force-fed a weird-looking bug, I get some sick-looking tattoos. And now it's time to go through the infamous Nocturne tutorial. Honestly, I was expecting this section to go very badly, but for the first time ever, I somehow managed to win all the mandatory encounters without dying once. Doing that gave me enough EXP to reach level 3, and now Demifin can learn Watchful. Thanks to this skill, he will be able to earn 75% of the total EXP once he is dismissed. After getting out of this hellhole, I go upstairs and grab my starter, the beloved Pixie. Now the only thing left is taking down the Preta Gang Squad. This permanently turns on random encounters, so it's time to recruit demons. I saw a Kodama, and after a bit of bribing, I convinced the little guy to join my squad. Then, once I managed to save my game, I found a white willow wisp in the tall grass, and after telling it that it was handsome, the demon got flustered and decided to, <laughs> to join me without my consent. <laughs> Man, that line always gets me. Now that I have three demons in my possession, it's finally time for the lunch break. So for this glitch to work, you need to make sure you got two demons summoned in the party and one demon in the stock. Then, inside the party menu, you select return to stock, and you use the mouse cursor to hover over the demon in your stock. Once that's done, with your controller or keyboard, you press down and A repeatedly, and when you back out of the return to stock menu, Demifin should be gone. Normally, when using return to stock, you cannot directly select Demifin, but if we use the mouse, we can put the selection cursor in the spot where it shouldn't go, in the stock, and this is what allows us to send Demifin to the Gulag. The demon in your first slot essentially becomes your new Demifin. If they die, you get the game over. Additionally, you cannot put a demon in the Demifin slot, so you can only have 3 demons on the field instead of 4. Having said that though, there is a way to get around that limitation, and we will talk about it when it's relevant. Also, on a side note, removing Demifin means that it's possible to start a battle without having any demons summoned, and when you do that, um, uh, yeah, you, you self-lock the game. I don't know why I expected something else to happen. 
Now, if this was a different SMT game, removing the main character would be pretty bad because they are the only unit with the torque command, and that's what you need to initiate demon negotiation. Luckily, this is Nocturne, and in this game, demons can learn torque skills. After a couple of battles, Pixie reached level 3 and learned the torque skill seduced, so now I can use her to recruit more goons. It's time to prepare for the main boss of the medical center, Fornius. This guy has an elect weakness, and this is great because my Pixie knows Zeo, but ideally, I would like to have another elect user in the squad. And this is where Shikigami comes in. Out of the 5 demons you can encounter in this dungeon, Shikigami is the only one with Zeo in its move pool. With my preparation completed, it was time to challenge Fornius, and to defeat that boss, I selected Pixie, Kodama, and Shikigami. The plan is simple. Shikigami and Pixie go for Zeo to hit the weakness, while Kodama focuses on Dia to keep them healed up. And this allows me to showcase one of my favorite mechanics in this series, the press turn system. If you hit an enemy's weakness, you can increase the number of actions your demons can take. So thanks to that Zeo, Pixie and Shikigami are able to act twice during the player phase. Fornius deals respectable damage, but my squad was able to soak up the hit, and with a final Zeo, Pixie got us the W. With the boss gone, I can save my progress and recruit Wapo, the earliest demon I can get with the fire spell Agi. Now that we are done with the medical center, it's time to explore the Vortex world. Se supone que esto es Tokyo. Ese tío de capaz de convencer a cualquiera. Ese trabajo es una mierda. En fin, manos a la obra. On the overworld map, you can encounter Zen. This demon is usually a pain in the ass to deal with, but thanks to Wapo's Agi, I was able to quickly get rid of it and make enough progress to reach Shibuya. This place is very important because it's the first city where you can access the Cathedral of Shadows. This is Mido, and he is the dude who can perform demon fusion for you. This guy is a recurring character in some of the SMT games, and he has a line that I simply can't get enough of. Come on Mido, say the line! Welcome to the Cathedral of Shadows, where demons gather. He said it. By the way, something that I didn't mention yet is that dismissing Demifiend has another side effect. In Nocturne, Demifiend is the only unit capable of using items, meaning that if you dismiss him, you cannot use items during battles anymore. This is actually a pretty big deal because now that he is gone, I have no way to use items to do stuff like healing my demon HP and MP. It's a pretty interesting restriction and I will have to play around it somehow. After dealing with some random encounters, Pixie reached level 6 and then something really cool happened. My Pixie evolved into High Pixie. In this game, some demons can evolve after they learn all their skills via leveling up. What's pretty interesting is that these evolutions cannot be obtained through fusion. Evolution is a pretty useful mechanic and it will definitely come in handy during this run. Speaking of demon fusion, the time has come to try it out. I decided to fuse my WoW and the Pixie to get Preda. I also used this opportunity to purchase the Magatama Shiranui and I equipped Demifin with it. Caring about the Magatama might seem like a weird choice when I don't plan to use Demifin in battles, but don't worry, this will make more sense later. Once that was done, I met Shiaki at the club and braced myself for what's arguably the worst segment of the early game, the Facebook Metaverse. It wasn't easy, but after a couple of hours, I did manage to make it to the main boss of the area, Spectre. Alright, this should be a pretty easy encounter. Here we go again. At the start of the fight, you have to deal with 6 enemies, and while that's pretty difficult, this isn't even the worst part yet. Eventually, all the spectres will fuse into a bigger one, and the stats of this big guy depend on how many small ones fuse together. If you fail to take out a spectre, you have to deal with the strongest version of the big Changus, which has more HP and hits extremely hard. Now, if you do take down at least one spectre, the fusion will be weaker, so naturally, that's what I try to do, but uh, there is a problem. The spectres love spamming Aggie, and that's a fire spell. Unfortunately, a ton of demons in the early game are weak to fire. Remember what I said about the Preston system allowing you to get more actions? Yeah, the enemies also play by the same rules, so if you have a weakness they can exploit, you can bet they will do it. Now, I would love to leave this place and grab other demons to help, but there is no way to get out of the network once you are in. And I also don't have a save file right before entering this dungeon, so uh, yeah, I'm stuck. After looking at my team, I concluded that Shikigami, Preta, and Hypixie would be the best demons for the job. 
Pretty has Suku Kaja, which allows me to raise my evasion, and Shikigami can decrease the accuracy of the Spectres with Sukunda. Once three turns have passed, the Spectres will fuse. Knowing this, I decided to use the first turn to buff, and then I attacked relentlessly to knock one of the Spectres out. Buffing was useful, but even with that, the Spectres were still able to hit my demons, and I got bodied many, many times. After losing 11 times in a row, I got an attempt where I managed to take out the Spectre in time before they fused, and this felt great! Until the big Chungus took out Shikigami. My little Preta fought valiantly, dodging moves and landing attacks after attacks, but eventually, he got roasted by an Agi. The only demon remaining was my dear Pixie. Bro! Oh man. Come on, Pixie, you can do it. Kill it. Oh my god. Come on, Pixie. You can do it, Pixie. Oh, yes, you did it. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, that was so sweaty. Winning this fight allows us to reach Ginza, the city where we get introduced to a brand new mechanic, Sacrificial Fusion. Normally, during fusion, you can only select two demons, and the result of that fusion is always going to be at a fixed level. Now, with Sacrificial Fusion, you can add a third demon to the mix, and this allows your fusion result to inherit more skills from all the demons involved in the fusion, and it also gives them bonus EXP. Let me use Jack Frost as an example. Through a normal fusion, Jack is always going to be at level 7, and I can only give him skills from Kodama and Shigigami. But if I use Sacrificial Fusion and add my Wapo, the resulting Jack Frost will be at level 9, and I can also pass down the Aggie spell from that Wapo. It's time to get my Jack Frost. Wait, what is happening? P. After reloading my save because of the fusion accident, I was finally able to get my Jack Frost. This demon is very important because it has one of the best skills in the entire game, Dark Might. Dark Might makes it so your basic attack will always crit during a new Kagutsushi, and in a game like Nocturne where many bosses don't have a weakness to exploit, this skill is really powerful. In order to progress, I need to sneak into Loki's room and grab his prized possession, but doing so means that I have to defeat his bodyguard, the Troll. Lilim knows Taxi Gaze, a mind attack capable of charming your foe. Thanks to her, the troll couldn't do anything and I was able to grab the 1000 yen bill. It's time to explore the underpass of Ginza. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be down here because I get to see the mannequins. These guys are the best characters in the game, hands down. In this area, I can give the bill to the collector mannequin to unlock the path leading to Ikebukuro, but there is once again a problem. That problem is called Matador, and he has the bone to pick with me. This guy is the first challenging fight of the early game. Uh, okay, the second one. Papyrus over here has no weakness, meaning that I cannot get press turns unless I crit. This could have been an issue, but thankfully I have Dark Might. As long as my demons have that skill, I will be able to generate press turns with their basic attacks. That takes care of issue number one. The second issue has to do with his moves. Matador has physical and force skills, and this is a problem because at this point in the game, there isn't a single demon who has natural resistances for both of these damage types. Some demons have a physical resistance, but they don't have a force immunity. Other demons have a force immunity, but they don't have a physical resistance. I wasn't sure about how I could tackle this until I realized that one mechanic in particular was exactly what I needed. That mechanic is called skill mutation. After a demon levels up, there is a chance that said demon will attempt to change a skill. In the past, I always said no to this because the game doesn't tell you which skill is going to mutate, and I didn't want to lose a precious skill because of that. But here's the thing, not all the skills can mutate. In fact, only a select few of these skills can do that, meaning that it's actually not that hard to tell what's going to change. When a demon is attempting to change a skill, there is a chance that you will get a skill upgrade. When you get an upgrade, the skill turns into a stronger version of itself. For example, you can get Zio to turn into Mazio that way. What makes this mechanic really cool is that you can abuse it to learn some skills pretty early. Since Matador knows physical and force skills, my best bet to deal with this is to take demons with a physical resistance and slap Null Force on them. This sounds like a good idea, until you realize that the earliest demon who can learn Null Force normally is a Pazuzu at level 46, and Demifin is nowhere near that level right now. Getting the skill like this isn't realistic, and that's why I'm going to abuse skill mutation. Anti-Force is one of the skills capable of mutating, and when you get a skill upgrade, 
it's guaranteed to turn into Null Force. This is very convenient because Kudama learns Anti-Force naturally at level 7, so I just need to give Anti-Force to a demon and level it up until it attempts to change her skill. I made sure to pass down Anti-Force to my Jack Frost and after it reached level 10, I won the lottery and the skill successfully turned into Null Force. After that, I pair Shikigami and Preta to get Slime, and I use Sacrificial Fusion with my Jack Frost to pass down Dark Might and Null Force to that Slime. I was about to do the same thing for another demon until I realized something. You see, the reason I want to reach Ikebukuro so badly is because that's where you unlock the Pokédex, um, I, I mean the Demon Compendium. This feature allows you to spend money to summon demons, which is great, but I can't do that right now, so... I have to engage with one of the most infamous mechanics in the Shin Megami Tensei series, Demon Negotiation. Instead of enslaving your companions in Pokéballs, here you have to convince them to join you, and that means that you're going to get scammed a lot. They will ask you for your social security number, your credit card details, and then, after you give them everything they wanted, they will be like, uh-oh, my ex-wife just called me, um, bye! Ugh, it, it took a while, but eventually, I managed to get the demons I needed to fuse another Jack Frost with Rakukaja and Null Force. Then, I fused that Jack Frost with that Sueba to make one of the best demons of the early game, Koronzon. Normally, this guy is weak to Force, but thanks to the Null Force I passed down, I was able to cover that weakness. After making Slime and Koronzon, I really didn't feel like grinding to get another Null Force Demon, so I decided to fuse Nozuchi because it naturally drains Force. With my squad ready at last, I went back to the underpass to duel Matador. He always opens a fight with Red Capote to raise his evasion at plus 4. This makes him pretty difficult to hit, but unfortunately for our Spanish skeleton, my Slime knows Tsukukaja. It has enough MP to cast the skill 4 times, so I can use that to match Matador's Red Capote. And while that's happening, Koronzon can cast Rakukaja four times in a row to raise our defense. Thanks to Null Force, Mazan went from being one of his scariest moves to a free heal for my Nozuchi and a quick way to end the enemy phase. After spending many turns setting up, the time had come to go on the offense. There you go, Dark Might Gang, baby. Let's go! Ole! Oh, we are in phase two, aren't we? Uh huh. Boost my attack. Oh, I do need to heal there. No, nice. You know what? <laughs> he just died! Oh, first try, baby! Matador is gone, I stole his menorah, and after reaching Ikebukuro, I went straight to the Cathedral of Shadows to unlock the Demon Compendium. The Pokédex has two options. The first one is called View. I can spend Maka to summon whatever demon I've fused or recruited, so I don't have to get scammed anymore. The second is called Register, and it allows me to save a demon with their current level and skills in the compendium. Doing this will make them more expensive to summon, but it's a great way to save important skills. I'm gonna need a ton of Maka for my fusion shenanigans, and I just so happen to know a good way to get some. After beating Matador, you get access to the Labyrinth of Amala. In between the floors of this labyrinth, you can play a mini-game where you collect coins. Right now, I can only go through the pipe leading to the first Kalpa, and that one gives you 855 Maka when you find all the coins. It's not a lot, but considering how quickly you can finish the minigame, it's pretty efficient. Once I got enough cash, I started preparing for the upcoming boss gauntlet inside the Mantra HQ, Arthurus, Yakshini, and Thor. The demons I have currently can deal with the first two bosses, so I fused three new demons with elect immunities to handle Thor, Shisa, Apsaras, and Lilim. After that, I paid a visit to the Mantra. Isamu got bodied, I got sent to jail, and now it looks like it's time for my trial. The first prosecutor you have to deal with is the Fire Spammer Authors. Thanks to its Fire Absorption, Koronzon was easily able to solo that one. Yakshini tried to blow us away, but whatever she did was useless against the Nerf Force squad. As for this big guy, the poor fella tried as hard as he could to hit me, but thanks to my prep, I was able to steal his thunder, and he got absolutely bodied by the Dark Might Gang. And just like that, we are done with the mantra. Encantado, chaval. No te tomas esto muy a pecho. Yo, guys, look! There he is! The one and only Dante, el exterminador de demonios! And let me tell you, our beloved Devil Hunter isn't messing around. This hombre deals a lot of damage, can easily crit you to death, and if that wasn't enough, he can drastically decrease your defense with taunt. If I want to survive, I'm gonna need demons with a physical resistance and buffing skills. With that in mind, I fused three demons. Willow is. Slime and Koronzon. 
Coronzon was by far my bulkiest demon, so I made sure to give him media to heal the squad and counter to retaliate if he got hit by Dante's physical attacks. With Rakukaja and Sukukaja, I thought that the fight would be pretty easy, but I was mistaken. The Exterminador de Demonios is a tough foe, and very quickly, the fight started spiraling out of control. Oh my god! Oh, the confusion! Ah, oh, dang it. Are you for real? Slime! Bro! Can you play the game, please? He will <laughs> he return to the stock. All right, Coronzon, it's all you. There you go. All right, Coronzon, do it. Come on, Coronzon. Oh, he's working so hard right now. Oh my God, do it, Coronzon, do it. Yes! Coronzon! <laughs> Coronzon! <laughs> Nada mal. Admito que estoy impresionado. Me llamo Dante. Soy un exterminado de demonios. Es decir, que mi cargo a ser es como tú. Procura sobrevivir a ser entonces. Quién sabe. Tal vez tenga otra oportunidad de matarte. Ooh, that was sweaty. You know, something that I like about this run is that it's giving the spotlight to demons I never used before. If it wasn't for this challenge run, I would have never known how good Coronzon actually was. Ah, Coronzon, mi corazón. With Dante out of the way, I can meet Gozuteno and he rewards me by unlocking two additional demon slots. Hey, that's pretty good. In exchange for this gift, I have to destroy the Nihilo Bros, but before leaving this place, I figured I would take care of Daisoju. That didn't end well. Ugh. It doesn't matter what kind of challenge run I'm going for. Daisoju always finds a way to make my experience miserable. This guy always gets the first turn, and he has an attack called Meditation, which allows him to steal a ton of HP and MP. This means that he can easily kill one of my demons before I get to play the game, or if he feels like it, he can steal all their MP. And remember, I cannot use items to heal my MP, so if Meditation lands, my demons can't cast spells anymore. After a couple of tries, it became pretty clear to me that all my demons would need a physical resistance to deal with the monk. So, to prepare for the fight, I spent some time inside the money farming tunnel until I got 100k maka, and I did a bit of grinding until Demifin reached level 20. Reaching that level allowed me to fuse Momunofu, my first demon with the amazing skill Focus. And then I fused Blob. The best opener for this fight is when Daisoju decides to go for two basic attacks in a row. This allows me to buff my evasion and decrease his accuracy. Thanks to this rat, I was able to get the fight under control and my Koronzon finished off the monk. While I was trying to teach some skills to my demons, Malilim with Null Force got a skill mutation and managed to upgrade that skill into Force Drain. I did some sacrificial fusions with that Lilim to pass down Force Drain to my Koronzon, Momonofu, and Blob. We are done with Ikebukuro for now, so it's time to explore the next dungeon, the Assembly of Mudo. Just like its name implies, everyone in here loves spamming the instant kill spell Mudo. It can be a pretty obnoxious dungeon to go through, but by this point, I have enough demons with Null Dark to make this a non-issue. Once again, Koronzon proves to be very useful here. Not only does it block Dark, but it also learns Trafuri, a skill giving me a guaranteed chance to escape from random encounters. Thanks to that demon, I was able to quickly reach the bottom of the dungeon, where I met Vegeta and I had to face its furry general, Oze. Considering the fact that all my demons are focused and Dark Might, I'm pretty sure you can guess how that fight went. Yo, Gozuteno, I took care of the- um, okay then. Well, I guess now would be a good time to go to the Kabukicho prison. Ah, right, I almost forgot to deal with this guy. Nicolas Cage can be dangerous, but I built my squad specifically with this fight in mind. All my demons resist physical to decrease the damage of his health spin, they also have force drain to deal with hell exhaust, and if he goes for hell burner, Koronzon will drain that fire attack to end the enemy phase. Thanks to all these things, my goons were able to deal a lot of damage and then Blob sent Nicolas back to driving school. Speaking of Blob, that demon got enough EXP to level up, and once it did, it finally learned Mana Drain. I can use this skill to drain an enemy's MP, and because it's an almighty skill, it cannot be blocked. Thanks to Mana Drain, I finally have a guaranteed way to restore my demon's MP. The next bullet point on my list of things to do in this run is saving the mannequins inside the Kabukicho prison. The enemies in here are really obnoxious, but that shouldn't be a problem now that I have Trifu- Thank you, Shin Madame Tensei Nocturne. Mizuchi is the boss of the prison, and this snake has very powerful ice spells. Initially, I was going to craft a team for this guy, but I decided to do something spicier instead, fusing the ultimate Jack Frost and having that little guy solo the fight for me. 
With the Mirage gone, Giga Chat Futomimi and his followers are free to go back to the city of Asakusa. I'm also supposed to go there, but I have a couple of things to take care of, like exploring the labyrinth of Amala. Thanks to Trafuri, I can easily avoid the scary random encounters and flip the switch to complete the first Kalpa. Here you can find the Death Stone, an item that allows you to fuse the fiends, like the lovely Matador. I don't have much use for this item yet, but trust me, in due time, you will see me use it to summon the best demon in the entire game. Anyhow, we made it to Asakusa, a city filled with friendly mannequins. If you ask most players though, I'm sure they associate this location with a feeling of dread because of one simple thing, the Puzzle Boy minigame. Normally I would have to do this, but no 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 no, not today bro. Since I'm not using Demifiend at all, I can finally skip this stupid minigame. At last, I am finally free from having to play Puzzle Boy. Hello Demifiend. Wanna play some Puzzle Boy? <laughs> It's around that point that I fused the Chatter Skull, and I did it because this demon can learn Health Rust, a pretty strong physical attack with a medium chance to crit. After getting that skill, I made sure to slap it on my physical attackers like Momunofu, and I also did it for a very special demon. This is Oni of the Giga Chad clan. Speaking of Oni, while making this video, I found a copy pasta about that demon, and I would like to read you an excerpt of it. It all began the first time I got to Ikebukuro. When I finally reached the town, I was greeted by the biggest, manliest demon I've ever seen. Oni is perfect. Those crimson abs, gigantic powerful biceps that could snap your spine in half, and small beady eyes. It took every bit of willpower that I had to power through the Mantra HQ and continue with the game. But then, later came the Ikebukuro tunnels. Immediately, knowing that I was going into a dark tunnel complex with four big strong Oni lurking around got me super aroused. I was sweating buckets, my hands clamming up and my Captain America underpants were getting tight. When I ran into the first Oni down there, I completely lost myself. When it attacked me, I couldn't bear to attack back. I just wanted to let him be br- <laughs> No, 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 no. I, I, I am not reading more of this. God, I could just imagine it. My battered body being thrown over the fog's shoulder and carried for hours to the deepest point of the tunnels, being roughly hurled to the ground as all four of them whipped out. <laughs> no, 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 no. After fusing my Giga Chad, I made another Chatter Skull, this time for the purpose of abusing skill mutation. You see, when I was talking about skill mutation earlier, I didn't give you the full story. When the skill attempts to mutate, there are actually two possible outcomes. One of them is a skill upgrade, and that's the one I covered. The other outcome is called the skill change. Every skill has a rank assigned to them from 1 to 14. When the skill undergoes a change, it will mutate into a random skill from the next rank. Let me use Zio as an example. This spell can mutate and is rank 1. So if I get a skill change on my Zio, it means that it can mutate into a random skill from rank 2 like Dia or Shibabu. Now that you understand how the system works, you can get a ton of skills very early, and in my case, I'm going to use it to snipe debilitate. Null Force can mutate and is a rank 7 skill. If it mutates and I get a skill change, I can obtain a random skill from rank 8, and Debilitate just so happens to be in that pool of skills. So in order to make sniping Debilitate easier, I had to make sure that Null Force would be the only skill capable of mutating. Out of these 8 skills, 2 of them can mutate, Null Force and Dark Might. When Chatter Skull levels up, I can replace Dark Might with Hellfrost, and this ensures that if I get a skill mutation, it can only happen to Null Force. But even with everything I did, the process still took forever. The skill mutation text only has a 25% chance to show up, so most of the time you're not going to see it. And even when you do get it, you have to hope that you get debilitate out of the 19 skills inside rank 8. After spending hours rolling the gacha, eventually I finally hit the jackpot. Null Force changed into debilitate, and just like that I managed to get the best debuffing spell in the entire game very early. Oh, by the way, I also made sure to save my Chatter Skull and template in the Compendium. Thanks to that, I can resummon this guy to roll the gacha in order to obtain some of the other really useful skills from rank 8. I did that a couple of times to obtain various useful skills like Glacial Blast, Tetra Karn, Makara Karn, and Mana Surge. Mana Surge in particular was another skill I wanted because it increases your max MP by 30%, and that should make it easier for my demons to cast skills with a high MP cost like Debilitate. Now I must prepare myself for my next foes. At the very top of the obelisk, you will find the Moira sisters. Clotho heals, Lachesis buffs, and Atropos uses powerful spells. Oni is going to be my damage dealer, and for the two other slots, 
I decided to fuse this and Raiju. This drains fire and provides support. I also did a bit of gacha to get her Diarama skill to upgrade into the AoE healing spell Mediarama. As for Raiju, it feels a role similar to this while providing Drain Elec. This is a fight where Mana Surge truly shines. Thanks to that passive, it's a lot easier for my demons to click debilitate and after two turns, the sisters were fully debuffed. From that point onward, I had the entire fight under control. If my support demon needed MP, I could still sub with Mana Drain. My resistances allowed me to minimize the amount of damage I was taking, and if needed, this could always heal the squad. Clotho fell pretty quickly, then Lachesis followed suit, and Giga Chad only offered me the win with a powerful basic attack. The teacher is finally rescued, and it turns out that without her, the Nihil Lobros cannot pay their bills anymore. As soon as you complete the obelisk, you can go back to Shibuya to fight another optional boss, and it is none other than the long schlong himself, Mara. This guy has two press turns and is guaranteed to go first at the start of the fight. This forces you to survive the first enemy phase, and unfortunately, my demons don't have enough stamina to last long enough. Mora hits extremely hard with Hades Blast and this Maltoon. If he attacks twice, it's a game over. Even if he only attacks once, Hades Blast can easily crit me and then he gets to blow his load all over me again. After losing so many times, I decided to change my approach. The easiest way for me to survive is if Mara goes for this Maltoon or Mara and Karin, because I can tweak my demons to block these. I remade the Koronzon with Null Mind, and then I fused the Pisaka. After losing 7 times in a row, my new squad managed to survive, and now that everyone is healed up, I can show you the strat. So now I'm going to showcase a very very funny strategy against Mara. So if I do taunt twice, Mara's defense goes to minus 4, and his attack goes to plus 4. Now the funny thing is what happens when I use Tetrakarn and Mara goes for Hades Blast. Let's see if I can get to showcase that to you. <laughs> Let's go! Ding, ding, ding! <laughs> he just killed himself! <laughs> oh, this is so silly. I love it. This is the Tetrakarn cheese. Tetrakarn reflects physical damage back at the foe, and the reflected damage is affected by buffs and debuffs. Now, what's really cool about reflected damage is how it interacts with an AoE. If an AoE like Aedes Blast is reflected, the foe will take damage for every unit targeted by the move. In this case, Hades Blast targeted my 3 demons, and since it got reflected, Mara smacked himself 3 times in a row. It's a pretty fun strat, and I plan to use it again for another boss. Alright, that's enough fun for now. Back to the Kalpa as we go. The second Kalpa to be specific. I was able to find the Moon Key pretty quickly, but then I somehow couldn't recall where the exit was and I got stuck in this maze for a while. Thankfully, I got out of this place and after reaching the third Kalpa, I awakened the 4 Horsemen of the Apocalypse. White Rider is the first member of the gang, and he always summons two virtues before the fight starts. Killing the goons isn't ideal because White Rider will always resummon them. This makes them annoying to deal with, but I have a plan. These guys are weak to dark, and I can abuse that weakness with Koronzon's Stone Gaze. If this move lands, I can petrify the virtues, and as long as I don't attack them, they are just going to sit there and White Rider won't be able to resummon them. And now the fight should be very e oh, oh! Uh, um... Uh, yeah, God's bow is a problem. This attack has a guaranteed chance to kill a demon if it doesn't block light. As soon as he started clicking the move, things went downhill and I kept losing again and again. My third attempt was going well, but after losing Pisaka and Raiju, my odds of winning decreased drastically. Come on, Oni. Come on, you can do this. Let's go, Oni! Giga Chad! Giga Chad! Oh my god. Uh. Come on, Oni. Kill him! No! Let's go! Let's go, Oni! Giga Chad! Giga Chad! Yeah! <laughs> this guy is amazing! The next rider on the list is the Red Hood, who summons two powers to help him. Just like the Virtues, these angels are also weak to dark, so Koronzon can permanently take them out of the fight with Stone Gaze. This helps a ton, but I still have to deal with Red Rider, who has the terrifying Terror Blade. Terror Blade was a nightmare to deal with in my solo run, but here it's actually even more dangerous. See, when there is only one target, this attack can either hit you once or twice. But when it has multiple targets, Terror Blade can hit my demons once, twice or thrice. Eventually, the Red Hood got enough hits to finish off my Oni, and that gave me a game over. 
In my second attempt, I petrified the powers ASAP and went with Rakukaja with my Eligor. The defense boost made surviving Terror Blade possible, but the fight was still really obnoxious because Red Rider would always find a way to dodge my attacks. Eligor was able to heal everyone with Mediarama, and while he did die later during the fight, his job was done. Giga Chad only destroyed Red Rider, and he also took care of the power. And now, guys, it's time to show you something cool. Demifiend has finally reached level 33, and this means I can fuse Bafome. Why is this important, you may ask? Well, that's because Bafome has Beacon Call. This skill lets you summon a random demon from your stock during battle, and this is how we can put the demon in that fourth slot Demifiend left behind. Oh, by the way, since Beacon Call pulls a random demon from your stock, there is a chance that he can summon Demifiend, and that's the only way to get him back after he has been dismissed. Just so you know, I plan to stick with 3 demons during boss fight until I find a foe that truly forces me to bring 4 demons. Right now, I'm in the dire need for cash to fuel my fusion addiction, and I just so happen to know a way to get Maka fast. If you manage to get through the curse corridor inside the second Kalpa, Ifrit will give you 250k Maka. But here's the thing, inside the curse corridor, you take damage from simply walking, and the enemies you find are stronger than anything we've seen so far. I don't feel like dealing with all that nonsense, so it's time to use my secret technique. Glitches. The one I'm going to use is called Menu Storage, and to make it work, you need two things. Four demons in your active party, and you also need at the very least nine demons in your stock. First, you enter a battle and summon the fourth demon with Beacon Call. After the battle ends, you open the pause menu and summon a couple of demons from your stock. If you go out of the menu and in again, you will notice that the pause menu is completely dark. If you hit up or down three times then press A, you will open the Magatama menu and that will get rid of the black screen. Now the first thing you will notice if you did this right is that when moving the analog stick, you can hear Demifiend walking in the overworld while you are still inside the pause menu. Normally the game has a check that disables the summoning from the stock feature when you have three demons. But the thing with this check is that it's only active when you have three demons specifically. If you use Beacon Call, you can create a scenario where you have four demons in your active party, and when that happens, the check doesn't stop you from summoning demons from your stock. Another thing to note is that the game disables the overworld interactions when you are in the pause menu. This is what's preventing Demifin from moving while you are going through the menus. But when you use the glitch to summon more demons, the overworld check gets disabled. Menu storage essentially allows us to use the pause menu while interacting with the overworld, and this enables another cool glitch. Load Warping. When you load a save file, the game loads all the data from that save. Now, when you load the game while in menu storage, Demifin's physical location won't change, but the game will load all the other data related to that save file you picked. This means that we can warp one save file in the location of another one. The benefit of load warping is that it resets the encounter rate when used. The panic meter will turn red shortly before a random encounter occurs, so as soon as I see this, I can use load warping to load the save file. Doing this resets the encounter rate, and because I'm still inside the dungeon, I can keep making progress. Thanks to the glitch, I can easily get through this section of the game without seeing a single random encounter and reach Ifrit. The first time you talk to this guy, he will give you 250k maka. Normally, this is a one-time event that you cannot repeat. However, it's actually possible to duplicate this event with load warping, but before doing that, we need to use another glitch. Ladder suspending. When you use the suspend feature the vanilla way, the game sends you back to the title menu. Essentially, this prevents you from making progress after you save your game via suspending. This is how it normally works, but things change when you add menu storage to the mix. Thanks to menu storage, we can suspend the game in places where we shouldn't be able to, like suspending while climbing a ladder. What's interesting about ladder suspending is that if you hit suspend before the climbing animation ends, the game will still create a suspend save, but you won't be sent back to the title screen. If you did it right, it just looks like you transition to the next room normally with a ladder. So with ladder suspending, I can save my game inside the dungeon while still being able to keep playing. And now that you hopefully understand how this works, let me show you how to duplicate the Ifrit event. After navigating through the curse corridor, you go down the ladder leading to the Ifrit room. You then face the ladder and activate menu storage. While inside the menu, you run towards the ladder and press A. And then, you suspend the game while Demifin climbs the ladder. You will know if you did it right if you didn't get sent to the title screen. Once that's done, you go down, talk to Ifrit to get your cash prize, and go back to the entrance of the labyrinth. Then, when you manage to get there, you save your game at the terminal. After saving your game, you go to the title screen and load the suspense save you made earlier. Now we are back down with Ifrit and this save file didn't collect the Maka yet. We then perform ladder suspending again. Next, you go near Ifrit and activate menu storage. Once the glitch is active, you run toward Ifrit, then press A and while Ifrit is talking, before he hands you over the money, you navigate through the menu to load the save file we made at the beginning of the labyrinth. 
And voila, if you did it right, you just got the 250k marker twice. The gist of it is that we use a save file that didn't trigger the ifrit event yet, and then mid dialogue, we use load warping to load another save file that already got the cash prize. And this allows us to receive the marker on a save file that technically already received it. As for ladder suspending, we use it to save time. This glitch allows us to create a save file near ifrit, so we don't have to navigate all the way back down every time. It took me a while to understand how these glitches work, but now that I got the hang of it, I can abuse them to steal Ifrit's lunch money forever. I did this a couple of times until I got 900k Maka, and then I got out of the labyrinth. I then made the Nozuchi with Glacial Blast, and after leveling it up, it evolved into Xianwu. I went for this evolution specifically because one of the skills Xianwu learned from leveling up is Ice Boost, a passive that boosts ice attacks by 50%. Now Glacial Blast will hit harder, and I can transfer these two skills to another demon if I need to. I also used this opportunity to challenge Black Rider, and he got spanked by my Giga Chad Oni. I was pretty happy with the progress I made so far, so I decided to go back to the Ikebukuro tunnels to take care of the four optional Onis you can fight in there. As I was exploring the tunnels, my Momunofu leveled up and was able to evolve into one of the best demons for this challenge run. Arabaki! Baki nullifies physical, light and dark, repels ice and is weak to everything else. He has a lot of weaknesses but he more than makes up for them by having some of the best resistances in the entire game. Since you cannot recruit or fuse Arabaki, your best bet to teach it the skills you need is to give them to its pre-evolution, which is why I gave skills like Force Drain and Null Mind to my Momunofu. The three Onis got dumpstered by Baki, but sadly, I still have to take care of the most annoying one, Black Noir. Just seeing this guy again is enough to bring back a lot of painful memories from the No Demon run, but today, things will be different. I started the fight on the full Kagutsushi, so whenever Black Noir goes for Shadow Clone Jutsu, I can tell which one is the real deal by checking who has a shadow. All my demons have powerful magic spells, so as soon as I hit the correct one, I'm able to deal a ton of damage and eventually, my Black Ooze ended the fight with a final ice boosted Glacial Blast. With the three riders gone, I can use the menorahs I obtained from them to unlock the path leading to the third Kalpa. Inside this place, there is a shady broker who sells a really powerful demon, but in order to talk to him, you need to go through this golden door. To open this door, I need to have a dark alignment, and to change my alignment, I'm going to use Magatamas. See, in Nocturne, each Magatama has an alignment. When Demifin masters a certain amount of Magatamas, his title will change, and you can use that title to know if your alignment is dark, neutral, or light. In my case, I need to be dark aligned to open the door, and the fastest way to achieve this is to master two Magatamas. Shiranui is the earliest dark aligned Magatama you can find, and that's exactly why I purchased the thing when I was in Shibuya. I mastered it by learning all of its skills, and I did the same thing with the neutral aligned Magatama Wadatsumi. Once the Mifin finished learning all of its skills, his title changed from Fiend to Soldier. Now I can finally go past the Fang door and talk to the Shady Broker. I just need to spend 150k Maka, and then I will obtain the ulti- Wait, it's just a Preda? Yeah, this little guy might look underwhelming to you, until you check its skills. Yup, this Preta is absolutely fantastic. Okay, cool, so I just need to get out of here and I should- Oh. Are you for real? I just got one shot like that. Oh, Nocturne! Thank you, Shin Megami Tensei. Okay, back at the surface, I can go inside the Cathedral of Shadows to register this Preta in the Pokédex. Thanks to this demon and sacrificial fusion, I was able to pass down Megidoleon to Kumokuten, Mizuchi, and Yomotsu Shikome. It's time to go back to the Amala Network again for the second Spectre fight. In this one, the Spectres will steal your MP with Mana Drain and then hit you with the almighty skill Megiddo. Normally, this would be pretty annoying to deal with, but today, I'm going to give them a taste of their own medicine. You know, Spectre, that little strategy of yours, Mana Drain into Megiddo, that's cute. But allow me to show you something better. Megiddo Leon! Brah! Megiddo Leon! <laughs> oh, this feels great. After taking care of a random encounter, my Giga Chad only leveled up and was finally able to learn one of the best physical attacks. Dark Sword Gaming. This powerful attack has a high crit chance but low accuracy. No need to worry about the accuracy though because you can easily make up for it with buffs and debuffs. Now that Spectre 2 is down, I can go back to the third Kalpa to meet an old friend. Oh nice! Alright Dante, it's time for you to get out of this game. Go back to your series. There you go! Giga Chad Oni! <laughs> what the f- Whoa? Why are these crazy demons here? Oh my god, no! St 
stop! Are you kidding me? Did you just kill me? I didn't even save! I have to go back and fight Dante now! <laughs> this game! This is so silly. Oh, what is that? Oh my god. Ooh! What? What is this? Oh my god! Uh, he's gonna he's gonna panic someone, isn't he? Oh no! Come on, ride you, ride you, please! Oh my god, you do what? Oh my god, that doesn't miss. Yeah, we are dead. Oh my god, Dante! I expected this rematch to be easy, but uh, no, it wasn't. Dante too sometimes kept inflicting panic on my demons, preventing them from playing the game. So I decided to remake Raiju and Eligor, but this time I slapped Null Mind on them to block panic. Parece que has mejorado. Me alegro. Todo lo contrario. Eso sería muy aburrido. Oh, uh, here we go again. The last phase. Oh my god, it hurts. Oh my god, it really hurts. Dark Sword, let's go. Oh wow, 1k, that's amazing. Kill him, Oni! Let's go! Once again, the Giga Chad Oni prevailed. El Dante has been defeated, so I can watch the cutscene to officially complete the third Kalpa. Now, to reach the fourth Kalpa, I must defeat the last three fiends, and it's time to take care of the first one, Pale Rider. Oh, wow. Nah, yeah, that's fine. Let's go, Oni! Destroy these clowns! Oh my god! <laughs> okay, but we are fully buffed, so it's fine. Oh my god, you are so strong. Oh my god! Oh, Oni, you absolute legend! You monster! By the way, during the Dante fight, Demifin went to level 37, and this allows me to finally summon the best demon in the entire game. Daisoju is the ultimate support demon. With meditation, he can deal good damage while recovering his own MP. He also learns prayer, the best healing spell very early. Nerl Dark and Repel Light ensure that he cannot get cheated by instant kill attacks. Oh, and also, he has no weakness. Thanks to his other resistances, he never has to worry about status effect either. Now, all of these traits are great, but there is still one thing that I have yet to mention, and it has to do with how fiend fusion works. In Nocturne, each fiend can only be fused during specific Kagutsushi phases. In Daisoju's case, his fusion only shows up when the Kagutsushi phase is at 5, 6, 7, or full. The fact that Daisoju can be fused during a full moon is huge, because it means that you can use Sacrificial Fusion on him. With Sacrificial Fusion, you can transfer the bonus EXP to Daisoju to make him go beyond his original level, and this means that he's never going to fall off. Now that I can give Dark Sword Gaming to more demons, I went ahead and fused another physical attacker. He doesn't look like much right now, but eventually he will evolve into the Monkey King. Alright, my next destination is Yoyogi Park, but I can't access it from the west side. The section of the park I need to reach is the east side, and to go there, you have to go through the Asakusta Tunnels. Tunnels in Nocturne are easily some of my least favorite dungeons, so instead of doing that, I'm going to abuse glitches. There is a glitch called Cutscene Storage. It allows you to go out of bounds and clip through pretty much every wall in the game. Let me show you how it works. First, you stand as close as possible to a wall you want to clip through, then you go into the pause menu and suspend the game. Once you are at the title screen, you load into a different save file where you can trigger a cutscene. The easiest one to use for this glitch is the cutscene you get for checking the peephole inside the labyrinth of Amala, so I'm going to load a save file at the start of the labyrinth. After loading the save, you get close to the peephole and activate menu storage. Then, while you are inside the pause menu, you walk forward and trigger the cutscene. While the cutscene is playing, 
you navigate through the menu to click on load, but instead of loading a save file, you back out of the menu. If you press B a couple of times, the game will kick you out to the title screen while the cutscene is still playing. Next, from the title screen, you select the suspended save you made earlier, and after loading the game, you will notice that all the collision hitboxes have been disabled, and you can move through walls. Now you just need to move a tiny bit forward to clip through the wall and open the pause menu to suspend the game before the cutscene finishes. Doing this will cancel the cutscene, and once you load the newly suspended save, you will be able to traverse the walls. This dungeon has various ambush points where fairies will pop out and send you back to the entrance. Choke and die, jerk! It's a trial and error type of dungeon, but since I already knew where the fairies were hiding, getting to the end didn't take a while, and now I can challenge Sakahagi. That is what I would like to say, but before we get to do that, we need to address the elephant in the room. The number one advice most people will give you when fighting Girimekala is to avoid using physical attacks, and I'm going to show you why that is the case. Yeah, this elephant repels physical attacks, so you have to use spells instead. Giri also removes debuffs right away with Dekunda, so I can't cheese him with debility. Sadly for the big fella, he doesn't have Dekaja, so he cannot prevent my goon from buffing themselves. After maxing out our defense, evasion and magic, Mizuchi and Eligor can go to town with their ice-boosted glacial blasts. This is Daisoju's first fight and he's already proving how good he is. Since he absorbs mind, he can shut down the enemy phase whenever Giri Mekala goes for a mind attack like Panic Voice, and once he's at plus 4 magic, Meditation is capable of stealing a ton of HP and MP. The elephant tried really hard but wasn't able to keep up with my squad, and with a final glacial blast, Mizushi was able to put him out of his misery. You're one hell of a monster. I used all that Magatsuhi to summon that demon, and look what happened! Enough of this! Anyone who gets in my way dies. Now, it's time for your salvation. Receive my cum. Shit! After grabbing the Yahiro no Imorugi and giving it to the teacher, I can go back to the west side of Yoyogi Park to spank Mother Arlot. <laughs> Once again, my undead monk is amazing for this fight. The fact that Daisoju absorbs curse attacks comes in handy here. Blocking an attack takes away two press turns, but absorbing or repelling an attack completely shuts down the enemy phase. And if my demons get affected by a status ailment, I can use prayer to remove it and fully heal my goons. Yeah, I think I got this fight under control. After Shiaki gets her no-nut November arm, we can go back to the Kabukicho prison to face Black Frost. Suck him dry, Daisoju! Oh, the damage is insanely high, wow! Good stuff. Again, make it on! <laughs> I'm in danger! Once you defeat Black Frost, you will finally learn the truth. It turns out that he was just a regular Jack Frost all along. You might think that I just bullied the little guy, but really, all I did was punishing Jack Frost for wearing blackface. Oh, also, before he bites the dust, there is that one cursed frame where you can see Jack Frost without the jester hat. I can't unsee it, and now neither can you. You have my regards. It's almost time to jump into the Amala network again, so I decided to add two new demons to my roster, Horus and Okuninoshi. I made sure to give them Megidoleon as well as various useful skills before entering inside the metaverse, then I challenged Spectre for the third time. I... I just kill you! That's all I do! I won't die! Even if I die, I won't die! Okay. Alright, Spectres, time to die. Make it on! <laughs> Boom! Easy. Spectre won't be bothering us anymore, and now it's time to explore the Amala temples. There are three temples to explore and three big boss fights to go through. Let's start with Asiel. Hey, did you know that this guy's ultimate attack is called Soul Neck? Hey, stop! If you remember how the Mara fight went, I think you already know what's going to happen here. Bim, bim, bim! <laughs> Next, we have Skadi. Her most dangerous attack is called Earthquake, and it hits like a truck, but it has two flaws. It's a physical attack, and it is very predictable. Whenever Skadi goes for two Taruka Jazz in a row, she's guaranteed to use it on the next turn, so I know exactly when I can click Tetra Karn to avoid taking damage. From there, you debuff her with Debilitate, buff yourself with Makakaja, and she should be gone in no time. As for Albion, it was fairly straightforward. Okuninushi deleted his last minion, and Giga Chad Oni sent Albion to Nirvana with Dark Sword Gaming. 
You know, it's been a while since I've seen a mannequin. Let's see how the Twitchy fellas are doing. Ugh, I always get sad whenever I reach this part of Nocturne. We finally get to explore Mifunashiro, which is the prettiest dungeon in the entire game, but the only time we can explore it is during the mannequin massacre. I'm sure you've come to understand what I told you before. That only the strong and capable should be allowed to exist in this world. You know, by that logic, you should not exist, because if it wasn't for Gozu Tenno, you would be weak. The Archangels do not believe in buffs and debuffs. Unfortunately for them, this is Nocturne, so it's time to convert these non-believers by showering them with debilitate. Dark Sword. <laughs> Dark Sword! Good job, Oni. <sighs> Unfortunately, this victory is a bittersweet one, because I have to watch Futomimi die again. Don't worry, buddy. This isn't the end of the road for you. I will make sure to get you your revenge. You know what's also messed up? At the start of this dungeon, you can find a hiding mannequin who's asking you to beat the demons. After completing the dungeon, I hurried to tell the news to the guy, only to notice that he wasn't there anymore. I really wanna believe that he somehow found a way to escape, but I think you and I both know what happened. It's unfortunate, but the struggle must go on, so I decided to prepare myself for the last Fiend boss fight, Trumpeter. Oni and Mizuchi are perfect for this, so for my third demon, I went ahead and fused the Fiend Hellbiker. As you can see here, I wasn't able to fill his last two slots. Fortunately, there is an easy fix for this, and it's called Mitama Fusion. When you fuse a demon with a Mitama, you get the same demon again, but with some stat boost. And in Nocturne, Mitama Fusion allows you to fill the empty slots on a demon. So after fusing Hellbiker, I can give the skills I need to a Mitama, and fuse that Mitama with Hellbiker to teach him the last skills he needs. Trumpeter's scariest move is Evil Melody. This attack is a guaranteed one-shot on whoever has the lowest HP percentage-wise. You can survive this attack if you have the skill Endure, but none of my demons can get it right now, so whenever he clicks this move, he can easily delete one of my goons, and if Evil Melody goes into the demon in my first slot, it's a game over. But wait, there is more! He also has another move called Holy Melody, and that one will heal whoever has the lowest HP percentage, including Trump himself. So, if he's really low and you fail to finish him off, he can heal himself with Holy Melody, and at that point, you won't be able to deplete his HP bar before Evil Melody deletes you. Fortunately for us, they are quite predictable. On every fourth turn, Trump always alternates between Holy Melody and Evil Melody. With this in mind, I decided to change my approach. Come on, heal me. There you go. Hey, outplayed. Now, Oni, it's all you, buddy. Destroy this clown. Oh. Nice try. You got this, Oni. You got this, my Giga Chad. Destroy this clown. Dark Sword. Blah! Okay, now I can explore the diet building. Um, actually, no, I can't because in order to get to that dungeon, I'm forced to go through the Yurakucho station, which is yet another one of these terrible tunnels. Now, I could do just that or I could do something better. Abusing glitches. The diet building is located not too far below the part of the map with the Amala temple, so I can just use the custom storage glitch to face through the ground and reach my destination. Search is the gatekeeper of the building, and to make sure the fight would go smoothly, I fused Ultras, Nicolas Cage, and Naga. That Naga evolved into Naga Raja, and after leveling it up, I was able to teach it Null Fire. Now that my three demons block fire, Cert can't hit us with his strongest attacks. And if he tries to go for physical attacks instead, I can just spam Tetrakarn. In the end, Cert spent 10 years hitting himself, and then Naga Raja decided to put him out of his misery. In preparation for the mod boss fight, I fused a Raiju and I gave it Megiddo specifically for the purpose of getting a skill change as a mutation. This took longer than I expected, but my perseverance was rewarded because eventually I got Megiddo to mutate into Boltstorm. This is pretty convenient because Raiju naturally learns Elect Boost. After slapping these two skills on as many demons as I could, I made enough progress to reach Mada, the second boss of the building, and it did not go very well. His Hades Blast kept dealing a ton of damage to me with critical hits, and when he wasn't critting, he was confusing my demons with Intoxicate. Daisuju has prayer, so he should be able to cure these ailments, but my two other demons always get their turn before he does, so I'm never able to heal them in time. I was contemplating redoing my fusion for this boss, until I thought about another solution, and it has to do with how the turn order works. In Nocturne, the turn order is determined by the agility stat, so if we take into account the agility of these three demons, Phantom is first, Daisoju is second, and Naga Raja is last. 
Where things get interesting though is when multiple demons have the same agility. Whenever that happens, the turn order is decided by the slot position. I have two agility instances in my bag right now. If I give them to Daisoju, I can bump his agility stat to 15. The same number as Phantom. Now, if I put Daisoju in the first slot, he is guaranteed to always go first. So if someone gets intoxicated by Mada, I can always click prayer with Daisoju to cure them before they get their turn. After doing this, my demons were finally able to play the game, and with his signature meditation, Daisoju was able to suck Mada dry. And now, it's time to tackle the boss every Nocturne fan was waiting for, Mott. In the PS2 version of Nocturne, this guy was able to do crazy things like spamming Beast Eye 69 times in a row, but according to the people in my comment section, he doesn't do that anymore. So this should be an easy W for me. Are you for real? Whoa! Oh my god! He, oh my god, he's doing the beast eye thing. He's doing the thing. Oh my god, stop. Oh uh, yeah, GG. <laughs> oh, oh my god. I will never trust the people in the comment section ever again. On board, Slifer, the executive producer. This fight ended up being harder than it should have been because Slifer loves buffing its defense with Rakukaja and I forgot to teach the Kaja to my demons to make sure they could remove those buffs. Luckily for me, Giga Chad Oni was once again here to save the day. The three candidates who want to reshape the world have summoned their guards, and the Tower of Kagutsushi is now accessible, but before we enter inside, I need to finish the labyrinth of Hamala to secure the EPIC DEMON ENDING. The master of the fourth Kalva is the tyrant Belzebub. Because of his resistances, the only element that's worth using against this giant fly is fire, so my three demons will need fire boost as well as a decent spell like Hellfire. The other thing that my demons are going to need is Null Dark, because Belzebub has a move called Death Flight, and it will kill whoever doesn't nullify that element. With these things in mind, I found three demons with Null Dark who were perfect for the job. Mizuchi, Hellbiker, and Berith. After crafting my team, I went to the fourth Kalpa to challenge its master. Oh, of course you attack first. Really? Uh, yeah, so I just realized something. Normally in this game, a boss is guaranteed to either attack first or let you get the first turn. This is how 99% of the game works, except for Belzebub. For whatever reason, this guy can let you have the first turn or if he feels like it, attack you before you get to even do anything. In my first attempt, Belzebub decided to delete my Hellbiker before I could do anything and I was never able to recover from that. This time around, he decided to let me play the game so I can show you how the fight actually works. Hellfire deals a good amount of damage, but I vastly underestimated how bulky Belzebub was. Even with the combined efforts of my three demons, the giant fly refused to go down. Eventually, Mizuchi and Berif reached a point where they didn't have enough MP to cast the spell anymore. This was concerning, but I knew the fight wasn't over because I had the powerful Hellbiker by my side. I made sure to give him Life Drain, a more powerful version of Mana Drain capable of draining HP and even more MP. Thanks to the skill, I could make sure he had enough MP to heal the squad with Medi Arahan and hit Belzebub with Hellfire. This fight is also perfect at showcasing one of the reasons why I love the SMT game so much. The pass mechanic. If a demon can't do much during its turn, instead of attacking with that demon, you can just click pass to let another demon better utilize that turn. With this mechanic, I can click debilitate with Hellbiker, attack with Berry, and pass Mizuchi's turn to then let Hellbiker act again to heal the squad. This battle took a while, but thanks to Hellbiker's support, my goons were able to incinerate Belzebub on their second try. There you go. Good job, Hellbiker. Hey, my goons. Good job, bros. You did the work. Now I just need to reach the last floor of this dungeon, the fifth Kalpa. Normally, to get to the fifth Kalpa, you would need to follow a convoluted side quest sending you all over the place, but by now, I think you've realized that this playthrough is anything but normal. This door right here is the one halting my progress, so instead of playing the game the way it was intended, I can perform the cutscene storage glitch to clip through the door and avoid having to do the side quest. After doing that, I went back to the Cathedral of Shadows to prepare the team I would be using to defeat the final challenge of Amala. Metatron, the voice of God. After looking at my current options, I picked three specific demons. Anuman with the evolution of Ankot, the god bird Horus, and last but not least, the living wall itself, Arahabaki. I then gave them the various buffing and debuffing skills I would need, and I went back to the labyrinth. 
Oh yeah, this is the part where you can recruit El Dante, but I don't plan on doing that. Don't worry though, because El Exterminador de Demonios will have his time to shine in a future video of mine. Alright, the time has come to face Metatron. The first phase of the fight is pretty difficult because Metatron hits really hard and regularly spams the Kaja or the Kunda to get rid of your buffs and debuffs. This behavior makes the fight more difficult, but it can also be used to your advantage. As long as you buff and debuff to stay at plus 1 and minus 1, you can force Metatron to use the Kaja or the Kunda to waste one of his precious press turns. If he goes for one of these two moves, then he only has one press turn icon to deal damage to you, and that makes surviving a lot more manageable. I made sure to abuse this behavior, and after a couple of Glacial Blasts, I managed to reach phase 2. In this one, Metatron will start buffing himself more often. He doesn't spam the Kaja and the Kunda as aggressively anymore, so you can fully commit to buffing yourself and debuffing him. Putting Life Drain on all my demons was definitely the right call for this fight, because it ensures that they always have a way to recover MP to cast their spells. During Phase 2, I was able to keep the fight under control, but that quickly changed once Metatron reached his third phase. Uh oh. Oh my god. Okay. Oh my god, the fire of Sinai is going to be. Oh my god. Come on, guys, you can do it. Ah, we're almost there. Oh, we need to. Uh oh. Oh. I just need one more life drain. There you go. Alright, leave this, guys. Oh. Oh god, that's scary. Good stuff, Baki. Kill it! Oh, okay. Kill it! Let's go! Good job, my demons! Where is your god? Where is your god now? Well, we are officially done with the labyrinth of Amala. I can go past the boss arena and ride the elevator down to meet the old man. The epic demon ending is now unlocked and the time has come to tackle the final dungeon in the game, the Tower of Kagotsushi. At last, we are inside the tower. My new goal is to obtain the three stones of treasure while I make my way to the very top. And to obtain these stones, I must defeat the three gods in my way. Ariman, Noah, and Balavatar. Against Ariman, I'm going to use these three demons. Anuman and Gigachad Oni will be my damage dealers, and Loki will be my healer. As for Noah, it's a fight where my demons must have spells of the four elements, so I'm going to use these three demons. Loki will once again provide support, White Rider will hit Noah with ice and fire spells, while Yatagarasu will attack with elect and force. Now, I just need to level up Anuman to make it evolve. To do that, I could fight random encounters, but it would take too long, so instead of doing that, I'm going to use the Lord Warp glitch to challenge a boss I already defeated. Let me demonstrate how this works against Mott. Currently on this save file, I have already defeated him, so I can't fight that boss anymore. But I kept another save file where I didn't trigger the fight yet. So I can load that save, go near Mott, perform the menu storage glitch, move forward to trigger the boss dialogue while in the menu, and then before the fight begins, I load my other save file. And just like that, I have found a way to refight the boss as many times as I want to grind EXP. After defeating Mott twice in a row, my demons gain enough EXP to level up, and that allowed Anuman to transform into his final form, Son Goku. Hey, it's me, Goku! After struggling for an hour, I was able to reach this part of the tower where you need to solve a cube puzzle. I have no intention to spend 40 minutes trying to solve this thing, so you already know what time it is. It's glitching time! I used the cutscene storage glitch to deactivate the collision hitboxes, and for a few seconds, I was able to walk on thin air just like Jesus did. Demi Fiend, you uncultured swine. Everyone knows that Jesus walked on water, not on thin air. Anyways, I then suspended the game to deactivate the glitch. That allowed me to take the elevator and meet the first god in my way, Ariman. During phase one, Ariman forces you to play a game where he will forbid an action. If you break the rule, he will use Hell's Call to one-shot you, so you kinda need to respect those restrictions. He always opens the fight by forbidding physical attacks. This is perfect, because I can just take all the time I need to fully debuff him with debilitate and then max my buffs. Once that's done, Goku and Oni can sell up with focus, while Loki deals enough damage with his magic attacks to force Ariman to change the next forbidden action. Now, it's time to show you the true power of Dark Sword Gaming. Mmm, Dark Sword Gaming! Again! 
Ah! Giga Chad! Alright, Dark Sword Gaming! Oh my god! That's a ton of damage. Destroy this clown! Dark Sword Gaming! Let's go! Giga Chad! Yeah, baby! Good job, my demons. The next boss on the list of gods to reject is Noah, and for this one, I need to use my magic squad. At the start of the fight, this boss only spams his basic attack. This makes surviving pretty difficult, but it gets better after using a couple of debilitates and Rakuka jars. Once surviving becomes less of a problem, my goons can fully buff their magic stat with Makakaja and then use Life Drain to deal damage to Noah while making sure that they don't waste their MP. After taking enough damage, Noah will start using Aurora, and this move is what forced me to bring a magic squad to the fight. This skill does three things. It permanently gives repair physical to Noah, preventing you from using physical attacks. It heavily decreases damage taken by our mighty move. And lastly, it allows Noah to repel every element except for one, and the element it doesn't repel always cycles in a specific way. Dealing with Aurora isn't too bad at the start, but it gets more complicated as the fight drags on. The biggest issue is that it massively lowers the damage of Almighty attacks, and that's the damage type of Life Drain. As soon as Aurora is used, I go from draining 328 MP to a measly 33. And eventually, Noah will start using Domination to steal a ton of MP from my demons. When you combine all of these things, it turns a fight into a race and I need to defeat Noah before everyone runs out of MP. Uh oh. Oh my god. I think Bolt, it's Bolt Storm now. Yep, it is. Now we are back to glacial. Please don't no domination. Okay, good. Yeah, you're almost dead. Good. Come on, die. Die, die, die. There you go. Woo! One more friend rejected. Now that Noah's life has been snuffed out. Oh, shut up already. I can take this elevator to reach floor 402. Ah, uh, it's nice to see my fellow mannequins again. So, the thing with this section is that I need to take this elevator over here, but I can't do it yet. Once you go up the stairs, you will trigger an invisible teleporter, and then you will have to complete a maze full of even more invisible teleporters in order to get back here. Now, I could do that, yes, but I think you and I both know what time it is. After activating the cutscene storage glitch, instead of going forward, I'm going to clip through this wall and then suspend the game to cancel the glitch. It turns out that the floor's hitbox extends a bit further beyond the walls, so as long as I stay very close to the wall, I can keep walking out of bounds without descending into the darkness. And then, once I've passed the obstacle, I can clip through this wall again to go inbounds. At last, I have reached the one person I was looking for. It's time to make Shiaki pay for what she did back in Mifunashiro. There are two things that you need to pay attention to during this fight. The first one is her unique move called Bale's Bane. It's a cursed attack that's guaranteed to turn your unit into a fly. Thanks to Sacrificial Fusion, I was able to give Null Curse to Goku and Oni, so that move shouldn't be an issue anymore. The other thing you need to pay attention to is the trigger for her second phase. She has 13k HP in total, and once she falls below half health, she will summon her two goons. But here's the thing, this only happens once her HP drops below 50%, when she goes below 6500 HP. This means that we just need to deal enough damage to get her barely above the threshold, and then we delete the rest of her HP bar to skip the second phase. Destroy her with your Dark Sword Gaming! Avenge Futomi me! <laughs> Be gone, Shiaki! You know, as sweet as it is to dunk on Shiaki, I still don't feel satisfied. I wanted to have Futomimimi give her the final blow, but in order to fuse him, Demifi needs to be at level 63, and I'm currently 56. Alas, even in a run where I could finally let Futomimi have his revenge, it looks like fate decided otherwise. This was the exact moment I decided to make a separate save file where Demifin reached level 63 just for my homie. Let me show you how that went. One thing that I didn't know when I first played this game is that after witnessing Baal's Awakening, there is a side quest you can do to unlock Futomimi and Sakahagi for fusion, and the answer we seek lies inside the fourth Kalpa. This is the Curse Corridor, and it leads you to various different places based on what the moon phase is. If it's on 2 or 6, you will be sent to Hell's Maze, a labyrinth where the souls of the dead are trapped. It's a confusing place to navigate through, but eventually you will find the human souls of Sakahagi and Futomimi. 
After talking to them, you will hear about the soul who managed to escape the maze, and when you go to the Zoshigaya Cemetery, you will find the item that soul was carrying, the afterlife bell. Now you just need to go back to the maze and ring the bell to save the dudes. You know, I could also save Sakahagi. Would you be willing to lead my wandering soul to salvation? Uh, no. What was I thinking? Yeah, I just wanted to let you know that I have the power to save you, but I won't. At last, this is the moment we've all been waiting for. It's time to bring Futomimi back into the world. I'm sure you've come to understand what I told you before. That only the strong and capable should be allowed to exist in this world. Return to the mud you came from. Even you, you too, will rob us of our dream. No matter how much you demons threaten me, I will not yield. I will fight till the end to win our freedom. Ah, uh, my job is done. Time to go back to the main timeline. Okay, the three gods are down, so I should be able to... Wait. Oh, apparently that puzzle boy kid in Asakusa wants to see me. So, have you changed your mind? Listen, kid, for the last time, I don't need to do your stupid puzzle... Wait. If I don't complete puzzle boy, then I won't be able to obtain the Magatama locked behind it. And without the Magatama, I won't have the 24 Magatamas required to unlock the Lord's Sword. And without the Lord's Sword, I can't enter inside the Bandu Shrine to defeat the last four optional bosses I'm missing. Oh, man. I, I can't believe it. Even in a run where I don't use Demifiend at all, I still have to go through this stupid Puzzle Boy minigame. <laughs> well, it's done. With my reward in hand, I just need to purchase all the other Magatamas I'm missing and talk to Mido to unlock the Lord's Sword. I can then bring that item to the Grave of Masakado to enter inside the Bandu Shrine. Let's start with the easiest members of the Pillar Man, Zochu and Jigoku. These guys only spam spells of their respective elements, so you can easily beat them if you bring demons blocking those elements. In the end, Oni clapped both of them with his powerful Dark Sword gaming. My next foe is Kumoku, and he's a lot tougher than the first two clowns, so I'm gonna need to prepare before tackling this fight. I then glitched my way into fighting Mot again for that sweet EXP, and doing that allowed Demifin to reach level 58. This breakpoint is important because that's the level you need to be at to summon the third demon I'm going to use against Kumoku Ten, my favorite demon in the entire series, Giri Mekala. But before fusing my elephant, there is something I need to do first. Inside the fifth Kalpa, there is a golden door that leads to a shady broker who sells a very special Giri Mekala who knows the passive skill Pierce. But there is a catch. To open that door, you need to have Metatron in your party, and Metatron is a level 95 demon. This implicitly means that to open that door, Demifi needs to be at level 95. Normally, I would be forced to do a ton of grinding to open that door, but as the famous Chinese military general Sun Tzu once said, where there is a glitch, there is a way. Remember the ladder suspending glitch I used when I was stealing Ifrit's lunch money? Well, it turns out that when you perform this glitch, after loading the game, Demifin is placed out of bounds. I cannot enter inside the room from the golden door, but thanks to the glitch, I can clip through one of the walls of that room. Now that I'm inside, I just need to find the Shady Broker and give him 200k Maka to purchase my elephant. Some of you might be wondering why I waited up until now to get this demon. I actually did try to get this Giri during my first visit of the 5th Kalpa, but it turns out that the demon sold by the Shady Brokers have a level requirement. It's whatever the level of the demon is. The Giri sold by the Shady Broker is level 58, so even if you do manage to get there early, if Demifin isn't level 58, the game won't let you purchase that demon. It's a bit of a shame, but hey, at least I still managed to get Pierce pretty early. Now I can register this elephant inside my compendium to make sure I have an infinite supply of Pierce for my fusion shenanigans. This will be relevant later. After doing that, I fused my own Giri Mekala with useful skills for the upcoming fight, and I went back to the shrine to challenge Kumoku. I gave Bolt Storm to Horus and Giri to generate press turn by hitting the weakness, while Oni dealt a ton of damage with Dark Sword Gaming. Speaking of Giri, this demon repels physical attack, and that's kinda relevant to mention because... Yeah, I was about to finish this guy with Oni, but he decided to kill himself on my Giri Mekala. 
While I did win, I wasn't satisfied with this outcome, so I reloaded my save and redid the fight again to allow Oni to land the finishing blow. And now, there is only one foe left. The strongest member of the Pillar Man, the Shaman. For this fight, I'm going to bring Oni and Giri again. As for my last demon, it needs to absorb Bishamon's fire attacks and I know exactly who would be perfect for the job. The hero of the early game, Koronzon. Bishamon's weakness is ice, so I made sure to give Glacial Blast to Giri and Koronzon. Then I attempted the fight and to the surprise of no one, the boss who is known for being hard, is actually hard. With all the press turns he gets from using Dragon Eye, Bishamon can easily buff his attack or magic to deal a ton of damage to you. Debilitate is great for decreasing his defense and evasion, but it's not that efficient if I want to specifically lower his attack and magic. This is exactly why I gave Warcry to Oni and Giri. This skill decreases the attack and magic stats by two stages, and it makes dealing with the boss a bit easier. The first couple of times I tried the fight, my gang got clapped, but this time, I'm going to show the shaman that my demons are a bit different. I do need Koronzon to get uh, his MP back. Oh, I guess if you do a fire attack, that's fine. Oh boy. Oh no. Oh no. Bye bye, Oni. Oh, Oni, you lived! Yes, go! Alright. Come on, Oni. Destroy this guy. Dark Sword Gaming! Oni will have the final blow. Come on, Oni. Come on, Oni! Dark Sword Gaming! Let's go! With the four bosses defeated, the path to the main temple becomes accessible, granting me an audience with Masakado. And if you swear to protect Tokyo, he will give you the strongest Magatama in the entire game. Thou art the demi fiend, art thou not? Mm hmm. I'm also a Pokemon trainer. Wilt thou bring peace to Tokyo? Uh, no. I see. What? You thought I was going to get it? <laughs> Don't be silly. The only reason I went through this entire section was because of my masochistic tendencies. Ladies, gentlemen, and demons, we have reached the most important point in our journey. Now there are only two things left for me to do. Defeating Kagutsushi, the light of creation, and then beating Lucifer in order to obtain the epic demon ending. As soon as you defeat the Disco Ball, you will be thrown into the Lucifer fight without getting a chance to save, so it's important to make sure that your team can handle both fights. Now, when it comes to this gauntlet, dealing with Kagutsushi is fairly easy, but the same can be said about the Fallen Angel. I have managed to defeat all the other bosses with just 3 demons, but for this guy, I'm finally going to use 4 demons. And Lucifer has no weakness and resists every single element in the game by 75%. This means that whatever attack you use is going to deal shit damage unless you have Pierce. The passive skill Pierce allows your physical attacks to ignore resistances if you are hitting a foe with resist, null or absorb physical. Thanks to the Giri I got from the 5th Kalpa, I will be able to pass this skill to my physical demons, so dealing damage shouldn't be an issue. Also, on a side note, getting Pierce earlier than intended means that I can challenge Lucifer at a pretty low level, and that pleases my masochistic brain greatly. Unfortunately, there is another problem with Lucifer's resistances. It's the fact that he also resists Almighty by 75%. Because of that, skills like Life Drain and Meditation are going to deal no damage. This meant that running out of MP was going to become a big issue. I thought long and hard about how I could solve the MP problem, until one day, I had a stroke of genius. I realized that there was one specific skill that was perfect to solve my issue. Recomdra. The way Recomdra works is that the user sacrifices themselves to fully heal the HP and MP of the entire party. The fact that the user dies after using Recomdra makes using it kinda scary, but this won't be a problem because I have Beacon Call. Thanks to Beacon Call, I can summon another demon from my stock right after Recamdra is used, to get back to having 4 demons on the field. This skill is really good, but there is also another useful skill that I can use. Kamikaze. As the name implies, after using this move, the user will kill itself, but in return, it will deal a ton of damage to the enemy. Kamikaze is unique in the sense that it's an attack that's both physical and almighty. And because it's a physical attack, it can be boosted by using focus, it's affected by pierce, and it can crit. After finding the answer I was looking for, the next step was crafting the perfect squad to deal with Lucifer. Having Bacon Call grants me the ability to summon more demons from the stock, so ideally, all 12 of my demon slots should be occupied. This is when I decided to ask my good friend Zephyr for help. He is a talented challenge runner who completed a low level run of the game with a mod that gives an extra press turn icon to the enemies. If anyone knew how to prepare for the Lucifer fight, it was going to be Zephyr. So we got inside a voice chat, 
Then we started looking into the squad I would be using. And once that call ended, I had a better grasp on what was important to keep in mind for the team building. For this fight, there are three roles that my demons need to fill. Damage dealers, healers, and supporters. The damage dealers will be using physical attacks with Pierce to bypass Lucifer's resistances. Next, we have the healers. The most important thing about this role is that the healers need to be immune to all the ailments. Lucifer is able to inflict a ton of annoying status effects like charm and bind, and every kind of disease under the sun with root of evil. The easiest way to fix this is to make sure that the healers have innate resistances to all three ailment types. This will make sure that they can click prayer to fully heal the squad and remove the status effects. Lastly, I need support demons with specific resistances. Lucy has a lot of almighty attacks that you cannot block, but he also has fire and ice spells. Blocking those elements means that I can make sure Lucifer wastes his turn whenever it goes for them, and this is why I need my demons to nullify, absorb, or repel both ice and fire. After figuring out the roles, I went on the fusion calculator to find the right demons for the job. While searching, there were two things I was looking at. A demon's innate skills and their level up moveset. In Nocturne, demons have a certain amount of innate skills that you cannot remove with fusion. The only reliable way to get rid of those is to override them with the skills they learn by leveling up. This means that you can't fully customize the 8 skill slots on your goons, and it reduces the amount of slots you can work with. This is why I specifically looked for demons with useful skills like Lakshmi. Lakshmi only has two innate skills, Mediarahan and Seduce. Luckily for me, she learns two very useful skills by leveling up, Recarmdra and Mana Surge. As soon as she levels up, I will be able to overwrite her innate skills with these two, so during fusion, I can focus on filling her 6 empty slots with the other important skills I will need. Once the team building session was over, I went into the game and fused my 12 soldiers. Behold my demons! Jack Frost, Unicorn, Daisoju, Chimera, Loki, Jikokuten, White Rider, Suparna, Sarasvati, Goku, Lakshmi, and last but not least, Gigachad Oni. And now, this is how I'm going to fill the 4 party slots. Two of these slots need to be filled by demons who are going to stay on the field for the entirety of the battle. So I decided to put Gigachad Oni in the first slot and Daisoju in the second. Putting Oni in the first slot means that he is essentially my demi fiend. If he dies, I will get the game over, so I made sure to give him Endure to ensure that he could survive a lethal attack once, and I also did the same thing for Daisoju. As for slot 3 and 4, these will be occupied by demons with Rekamdra and Kamikaze. Their goal is to commit Sudoku when they need to, and then Daisoju can use Beacon Call to summon more of them. What, we some kind of suicide squad? With my preparations finally completed, I reach the highest floor of the tower and challenge Kagutsushi. The first phase is fairly simple. I fully debuff the Disco Ball with Debilitate, and then I can let my demons stack 4 Rakukajas and 4 Tarukajas. After that, Kagutsushi's attacks can't do much to me, so I just need Chimera and Oni to deal enough damage to reach the second phase. This is when Kagutsushi gets to use Infinite Light, one of the hardest hitting attacks in the entire game. From there, it's just a matter of clicking focus and unleashing your powerful physical attacks until the arrogant Disco Ball is no more. Hmm, I was expecting to find Lucifer down here, but I can't seem to find him. Well, I guess he won't be showing up today. In that case, thank you for watching guys, and I will see you in the next- He's right behind me, isn't he? Oh shit! Here we go again. Never mind, it's time for the final battle. Lucifer has three distinct phases and in the first one, he is pretty tame. This makes it fairly easy to set up with Debilitate as well as Rakukajas and Tarukajas. Right away I could tell that the time I spent building my team paid off. I made sure that my healers had the highest agility stat and doing that guaranteed that they would always act first. Thanks to that I was always able to use prayer to cure the status effects on my demons before they could get their turn. It felt like I had an answer for whatever Lucifer could do to me. If the squad was low on MP, I could click Rekarmdra. If I needed to remove one of my physical attackers, I could sacrifice them with Kamikaze. And if I was missing some demons on the field, I could use Bacon Call to summon more of them. Everything was working fine until I dealt enough damage to reach the second phase. This is when I discovered the two issues with the Bacon Call strategy. The first one is that the demons you summon don't have any buffs applied to them. This is a big problem during the second phase because Lucifer gets access to Dekaja and Dekunda. If he goes for Dekunda to remove his debuffs before you get the chance to buff your newly arrived demons, they are going to get killed by Lucifer's insanely powerful attacks. And this is exactly what happened to me. After clicking Dekunda, Lucifer managed to put me in a loop where he kept killing the demons I was summoning, and this alighted to me the second floor with my Beacon Core strat. Don't summon the Mifin, please. Of course you sum- of course, the moment I ask for that... <laughs> Whoever gets summoned by Beacon Call is completely random, so whenever I use the skill, 
there is a chance that it will summon Demifin. There is no way to dismiss Demifin during a battle, so if I get unlucky with my Bacon Call summon, the run is officially dead and I have to restart the fight. In order to find a solution, I analyzed my losses, and doing that allowed me to notice what the problem was. My party composition. I start the fight with Oni, Daisoju, a second physical attacker, and a support demon. This works for getting through phase 1 and 2, but in a low level run like mine, this team doesn't work during the third phase. So before we get to phase 3, I will sacrifice my second attacker to change my board position. I will go from 2 attackers and 2 supports to 1 attacker and 3 supports. So without further ado, let's give it a shot. Oh, Dark Sword Gaming, oh my god. Ah, uh, we are in P2, okay. Okay, we are in phase two. Iron Claw Gaming! Oh! Oh! Let's go! Oh my god. No. Oh, that sucks. That's fine. Okay, Vati, you're gonna die. Oh god. Okay, uh, Star Vati has to die right now. Okay. Oh, Root of Evil. Okay, we are in the last phase. This is good to know. Oh boy. Yeah, you have to die now. Alright, bye bye, go uh, Goku. We'll be fine. Okay, yeah, we are back to plus four. That's fine. Huh? The double high king? Oh my god! Look at that damage! Oh my god! He did double high king! It's very slow now, but at least I have uh, what I'm good. Oh, the crit! Oh no! 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 Double crit into high king! Oh my god! Double crit into double hiking. What is this? <laughs> what? Oh my god, what is this AI? Oh ho ho. I told you, you are so goated. Oh my god. I am so happy this demon is with me right now. Come on. Yes. Yeah, baby. Dark Sword Gaming from the Giga Chat Oni.